Thank you all very much. Um, please take comments that I make as a reinforcement of some core messages that have already been peddled by five opening speakers. And I make no apology for repeating one or two of these things because it's not about repetition. It is about reinforcing some of the key messages. But given uh, a few uh, tendencies to uh, have quotations from George Bernard Shaw and uh, uh, other interesting uh, intellectual uh, speakers and commentators, I thought I'd, um, I'd give you a couple. One is Aristotle once said that uh, if you want to give the illusion of progress, reorganize. And uh, reorganization is always the kind of answer that doesn't often answer anything. And the other one was John Steinbeck, who you may know of, who wrote The Grapes of Wrath, who said that there is no such thing as a lost cause, only a cause as yet unwon. So, and it's about battling and fighting. And I have about 20 minutes to try and capture about two years of effort where I've been at the kind of heart of it, writing this thing that you've got electronically and I've had made into a fake book. So, it's, uh, it, so it looks like a book. It's 65,000 words and 180 pages, and it has been a bit of a labor of love. Um, but I've been helped by a lot of people, some of whom are in this audience today, who've uh, emailed me, and we've had resonance groups, and I've had a lot of feedback and a lot of ideas. Some of my own ideas are not in here. Um, and uh, other people's ideas are in here, so I've tried to be democratic in the process of producing this thing that's called taking stock. Now, what is interesting about taking stock in some ways is that we have 14 years since the first European Youth Work Convention in 2010, which was held under the presidency, uh, Belgium's presidency of the EU. This book tells us that Erasmus not Erasmus+, Plus, but Erasmus for university students, took 14 years to develop from 1973 to 1987. And the head of the founding father of Erasmus, a man called Harold Kerry Jones, who has become a good friend of mine since Brexit, because we both hated that decision, and he knew very little about anything other than the higher education sector, and I knew about the youth sector. So Howell, although he's in his 80s, has been a big campaigner about um, exchange programs and so on. Because in 1973, Erasmus started with language learning programs uh, for teachers of French going to English schools and teaching French, French as he's done. And Howell saw this as a great opportunity to extend exchange programs for many kinds of university students. And I said to Howell in 1987, but not all young people are students. And I, that's all I said. I don't remember saying it, actually. He remembers me saying it. Uh, and and um, a year later, Erasmus was established, and youth, sorry, Youth for Europe, and then Youth for Europe II, and then the Youth Programme, capital letters, and then the Youth in Action program, which in English can sometimes be in action, meaning young people doing nothing, which is, not what it, which is not what it was meant, but it was created by somebody who was not a native English speaker. Uh, youth in Action program, and then Erasmus uh, Plus um, under Commissioner Vassiliou. So we've had 14 years, and we've developed a lot of stuff about youth work. Um, I do have a clicker in my pocket somewhere, which is, uh, here we are. And I've got a lot of slides, and I'm going to race through some of them, but all the arguments are captured in this, and I will race towards the end of my slideshow to show you some of the issues that people like Spiros have already sort of raised, um, <coughs> but I, I want to elaborate on those, because I think they are showing the way we live in a a Europe that is adversely affecting young people in so many different ways. You know, when you talked about rents and housing, housing was never a youth policy issue in many countries until relatively recently, and now it's the biggest crisis facing young people, particularly in the capital cities of Europe. Uh, so we have to think about how things move on, how the issues move on, and the capacity of youth work to respond if it is properly supported and advocated for politically and financially. Youth work is not the panacea, it's not the answer to everything. 
And Rarus, you know, rightly says it had a super influence on him. Um, and it does have a massive influence on some young people and has a marginal influence on others. So youth work is not always the answer, but it's part of the solution and part of the way we address some of these issues. Anyway, um, here we are. Let's try and flick through a bit more. Um, I put, the, I put these pictures up because it is the triangle. I, I was kind of this funny old magic triangle before it was thought about. Um, I left university. I liked being a youth worker, a voluntary youth worker. I didn't want to become an academic. I ran a youth centre for 25 years, an open youth centre, at the same time as doing contract research, about 75 research projects on housing and enterprise and drug taking and crime. And I got involved in policy work, not just in youth work, but around substance misuse and formal education and the youth justice system and the New Deal for young people around the transition from school to work and employment. So I built a kind of profile that was quite unusual. It was hard work as well. I was working a lot of nights and a lot of weekends and so on. But last Saturday, this picture on the right, this, uh, it doesn't matter that you can't read it, but I got a WhatsApp message. And that's a group of 50-year-olds who used to go to my youth club. And the w one of the women in there, she was a part-time youth worker, and she, it says, you know, you can probably read, I'm Sharon, at Sharon's... 50th birthday party, look who's here, it's been quite emotional, they all asked about you. I was in Finland. And I went home and I looked up some of my old photographs and the girl on second from the left in the picture on the left is Sharon Fisher, age 15, 35 years ago. And uh, so I know that the impact of youth work from that particular group. This is what Joanne wrote to me. They were all thanking me for the experience, and they were saying those times were the best of their youth. The weekends away, the, the, five, the six girls in that picture, that was taken at a safari park, uh, an activities park. <coughs> and five girls it was, I think, because sometimes I had to get dragged in on some of those roller coasters, and I'm terrified of heights, and I, I hated it. But uh, there we are. And then... The bottom right-hand corner is all the policy work I've done in Wales, in the UK, with the Council of Europe, with the European Commission, with the UN. Um, and on the left is all the books that I've somehow managed to find time to scribble and, and put together over the years, mainly about youth work, mainly about young people. And um, the book, this is the sort of uh, contents of the book, I'm not going to talk in detail about any of these things, but I do want to once again celebrate Belgium because Belgium has been very instrumental in driving this agenda forward in 2001 in terms of the white paper, a new impetus for European youth in terms of 2010 and the first European convention, Youth Work Convention, 2015, when it held the chairmanship of the Council, Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, the second European Youth Work Convention, and Belgium was also instrumental in helping to drive forward a history of youth work in Europe to develop a fantastic body of knowledge about how youth work has played out, has evolved, has developed in different parts of Europe. And of course, we all know that it's still incredibly different in different parts of Europe. Um, yeah, this conference is uh, being sort of underpinned and uh, the catalyst for this event was through the two snacks, Europe Goes Local and Democracy Reloading, and clearly we'll have a lot of opportunities to talk about the importance of local youth work. We're a rare breed when we're operating at a European level. Most young people live their lives locally. Most young people don't actually benefit from exchanges and so on. Some do. And that's great, but we need to make sure that youth work is anchored on the ground in local communities uh, for a whole range of reasons, <coughs> and particularly around the building of democracy. There's a lovely photograph in this, this book of my son when he was four. He came home one day and said he was on the youth council, the school council. Now, I, I knew nothing about these things, and... Uh, 
A few weeks later, I said, have you done anything big on the school council? And age four years and 11 months, he said that there'd been a debate about whether they should have a mural on the school wall that was about pirates and ships or knights and castles. And I said, is that the best thing that's be about being on the school council? He said, no, the best thing is my badge. He, he liked his badge. <clears throat> but it was a start, and we've got to embed that participation structure uh, that applied to Alfred at four, and Spiros has talked about within the Council of Europe. We need to embed that in all kinds of decision-making that not just directly affects the lives of young people, but almost certainly indirectly affects them as well. Um, so, I'm going to miss out that. So, there's a lot of stuff in this book about where we've come from. And of course, I've been around for a long time, but there are people in this room who are quite new to this. And it's, it's a long history, and it's a, sometimes a boring history. But it's an important history to know that we have worked very hard to put those building blocks in place to reach 2024 and to reach the idea of having a second EU resolution on a youth work policy. And I'll come to what those things will be about in a moment. So some of you will look at, looking at these slide, um, these words will know exactly what I'm talking about. Others won't. If you don't, talk about it, ask about it, ask people who know, learn about it. Because we have had probably 20 years, about 20 years, of youth work development in Europe. I would remind people that in 2001, youth work was not even in the white paper on youth. So, right. Um, let's have a look. Loads and loads of paper. Too many bits of paper, really. Um, too many council conclusions, non-binding resolutions of recommendations and so on. Matt has mentioned the recommendation on youth work, 2017, in the Council of Europe. That is a very significant document. There are some key documents that must be looked at to show our reference points for the development of youth work in Europe. And I'm not going to talk about these eight points, but the the declaration of the third European Youth Work Convention was called Signposts for the Future. You can see the list there. And that should have become, and I say should have become, the framework for taking the youth work agenda forward in Europe. I, sp I speak provocatively now because I'm not sure whether that has been the case. I think we have become inundated with a whole range of rhetoric, a whole range of initiatives under some banner called youth work, which are not coordinated, are not consistent, are not coherent, and therefore are still misunderstood by everybody outside of our particular field. And that's a huge challenge. So we're all over the place, not in a good way necessarily. Um, Right, again, I'm not going to talk about some of the detail. One of the best articles that has been produced recently has been by the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities in Europe about local youth work. That's where it starts. That's where it has to happen. Now, I've got a list of ten here. Health is last. The minister talked about mental health. Absolutely right as well. Well-being of young people. I put health tenth simply because most young people think they'll live forever, think they're invincible. And I put democracy top because I think that it probably is the most important anchoring point to deal with some of these huge challenges that are facing everybody in Europe, not just young people. But the implication of these things is particularly adverse for many young people. I was too late to involve Ivan Krashchev and Mark Leonard's very recent document about the five tribes who will um, be very significant in influencing the European elections later on this year, uh, around similar issues to those that are encapsulated within these ten themes. In this book, there's only a page and a half on each of these themes, or just a short account of some of the challenges, such as something like three-quarters of young people in the United Kingdom would prefer a strong leader rather than a democratic government. Quite a terrifying uh, survey 
conclusion. Um, looking at the implications of technology, a lovely report from the Oxford Internet Institute uh, fairly recently that, I said this yesterday as well, but uh, about how um, Facebook, there's no evidence that Facebook has had an adverse effect on young people. I felt like writing to the Oxford Institute and said that's because young people don't use Facebook. But um, that's, a, that's, a diff that's a different kind of question. Um, and then we've got a whole package of issues around mobility, not just about in-migration to Europe and all those sort of multicultural challenges that were highlighted in some of the previous youth work conventions, but about the out-migration of young people, the potential for mobility for young people. Spiros talks about, you know, mobility. But there is a lot of research now that many young people don't want to be mobile for a lot of different reasons don't want to be physically mobile because of the carbon footprint, because of fear of um, um, her, her disease and, and, uh, and just the cost, the sheer cost of travel. And so somebody called David Cairns in Portugal has written a lot about the immobility turn affecting young people. So all of these things have implications for young people. Now I've got about four minutes to run through five things. Because I'm a native English speaker, I always come up with uh, cunning plans to call everything by the same first letter. So some of you will know about my youth policy clock in 2002, which was about decision and de de decentralization and debate and development. And some of you will know about my cornerstone challenges, which informed the EU resolution on the European youth work agenda about the five C's about conceptualization and competence and credibility and cost and communication, coordination, I think was the other one. So this time, because Belgium loves the concept of play, um, the right to play, I thought, well, I've got to try and find some words that begin with P. <laughs> and, um, and also to disentangle this idea of the right to play, because there are countries in Europe where advocating youth work through the right to play would be a non-starter. That there would but not be political support for play, the concept of play. But there is significant support for la vie associative, for association. Association has been an, a bedrock of youth work ever since the early days of youth work in Victorian times in some parts of Europe. We all know about Lego. I'm not going to talk about Lego here. but I... We also know that the Second European Youth Convention talked about spaces, that the two things that bind us together as a youth work community of practice are spaces and bridges, spaces for young people to have autonomy, spaces for young people to have a voice, spaces for young people to have a place. And then the bridges are about supporting young people towards the next useful and positive steps in their lives transition, transformation sort of questions. That's different. I once wrote about safety nets and trampolines. But I remember a young man, he, well, he wasn't so young, he was actually a multi, multi-millionaire who'd been a youth club member of mine, and he, we were in his chauffeur-driven car going to some party, and he leaned over and he said, that youth club was so important to me when my parents were splitting up. It was a sanctuary, he used the word sanctuary, and uh, I think when you sort of have an opportunity to catch young people before they fall too far, I don't like the EU terminology of young people with fewer opportunities. What does that mean? But, I, but I've worked with disadvantaged, marginalised, excluded youth for a, a lot of my life, drug takers, kids who offend, dro school dropouts. And if you can catch them and build a relationship with them and persuade them that perhaps they need to rethink the direction of their lives, um, then... Uh, we've got a chance to spring them back into more positive places. I just, it's a story that's just come into my head, but there's a man, young man called Ryan Davis in Wales, and I coached him at football when he was 10. And he was the most horrible 10-year-old I'd ever, ever dealt with. He was the most unpleasant, and his dad's a bus driver. And I saw his dad, and his dad said, would, would I have a chat with Ryan? He's 19 now. He'd like a chat with you. He's doing the same sort of work as you. I thought, what? This cannot be true. And Ryan came to the university to see me, and he's now the events and marketing manager for the Lawrence Delalio Foundation, rugby as a form of, as a method of social inclusion of young people. 
charming young man, lovely boy. Uh, and he said, a little conversation I'd had with him went, privately, I told him he was an obnoxious little git. But I said, you know, you don't have to be. And he, he said he'd always remembered that conversation when I gave him a lift home one evening. I didn't know. Ten years later, I discovered that had made a difference to his life. So we can bounce people back. Uh, right, I'm looking at the clock. Here we are. We've heard this a lot of times. Useless policy is useless policy. A headline in the Reykjavik Declaration. Used to be nothing about us without us. Um, this is the new mantra, the new slogan, and absolutely right. Um, so I don't need to talk about participation. It's the area of a resolution that most of you know a lot about already. Um, then partnership. All I want to say here is that youth work will go nowhere unless it builds sensible partnerships with other parts of young people's lives in housing and health and justice and, and schools. But it doesn't have to be subordinated. And Minister said, said exactly that, that it should not be um, sort of marginalised by other agendas. It should stand alone. It should have a, an equal position but it can support young people in formal schooling. You made the point as well about youth work is not a substitute for formal education, and that's another important point. It's not much good young people having all sorts of developmental possibilities if they cannot read and write. And I used to be the parliamentary advisor on education in London, so that was one of my big concerns at the time. Um, I'm going to jump forward... You talked about the youth perspective, Spiros, and that is a Council of Europe position. And of course, in the EU, they use different language, but it's about youth mainstreaming. And this is a new sort of concept, which does provide some kind of opportunity for the advocacy for youth work within that framework. Though the whole question of gender mainstreaming and other kinds of mainstreaming have always been somewhat contentious. So we need to take a little care, care with that. Fourthly, Prove it. You know, all you in this room will tell me youth work's wonderful. Youth work makes a difference. Youth work saves lives. Youth work transforms development. Youth work is, is wonderful. Get out there. And people say, show me. Tell me how. And we have internal evaluation strategies that sound very good to us and mean absolutely nothing out there to other people. And then we enlist, we commission at great expense PricewaterhouseCoopers to do something on the social return on investment of youth work, and then it doesn't make much sense either. So methodologically, we need to find good mixed methods to try to find ways, I don't want to use the word measuring, but trying to find ways of demonstrating the claims that we make for youth work. And the last thing is about education and training. That we have, across Europe, an incredibly patchy and uneven approach to equipping individuals with the kind of skills, well, you said knowledge, skills, attitudes, values, and critical understanding, the competencies to be a youth work practitioner. We spend a lot of time talking about the areas youth work should practice. Youth work can practice almost anywhere. It's how the practice is done. It's the relationships and trusts that are engendered. How do we equip people to become youth workers? How do we support existing youth workers to become better youth workers? What should be the nature of the curriculum? How much should be practice? How much should be theory? We still have not cracked that problem. And I'm not asking to write the definitive curriculum for youth work tra training, youth, uh, youth work professionalization across Europe. That's a long way off. But we have to think about what are the core things that we really want to equip individuals who say they are doing youth work, to equip them with so that they do the best youth work they possibly can with the young people that they're doing it with. Um, this would be a different lecture, so don't worry, I'm not going to do this. I put this mind map together once because it's my life in Europe. On the right-hand side is my youth work life over 40 years, and on the left-hand side is my youth policy life in Europe over 40 years. And usually when I go to Australia or America or 
Hong Kong or somewhere, that's all I take with me, and that's all I ever talk about. But it's just to show what we have achieved through the conventions, through the publications, through the networks, through the events such as this one, that we did not have, when I started in the early 1980s, that simply did not exist. The Council of Europe had started its youth centre in Strasbourg in 72, so there were small bits here and there. But now we have a body of experience, knowledge and understanding. The question is how we pull that together, hopefully through a resolution on youth work policy in the new Europe, but how we pull it together through conversations that we will have over the next couple of days and elsewhere in our lives so that we develop a coherent narrative about what we are about and what we want to achieve. There is no such thing as a lost cause, only a cause as yet unwon. Thank you.